Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Alleluia. <laughs> the Gospel of John opens the resurrection narrative with these words. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so begins the greatest of mysteries, the most amazing of events, and the best news that the world has ever known. Well, that is what we are celebrating, isn't it, this morning. But for that first person to see and to hear this news, Mary Magdalene, it's not quite the day of celebration for her that we celebrate today. For this one solitary, lonely woman, the news that we remember today is anything but a celebration. Indeed, it was devastating, beyond more than she could comprehend. But to begin with, for her, this isn't a day of celebration and joy, but a day of anguish. As we hear her cry, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Put yourselves in Mary's shoes. Can there be anything more heartbreaking than this? A number of years back, um, the Guardian newspaper ran an advertising campaign to encourage people to read its newspaper. Uh, this was in the days when there were around 30 million copies of newspapers, all the newspapers, sold in the UK every day. Um, at the moment, it's around 2 million and still falling. So you can see how long ago this, this uh, advertising campaign was. It was a very simple commercial, uh, which unfolded something like this. Scene one, a car pulls up on the corner of a street and we see a skinhead. Um, I had to look up the definition of that for you. So this is what it says. A young man of a subculture characterized by close cropped hair and heavy boots, often perceived as aggressive. Okay, so we all know where we are. Uh, so this skinhead running away towards us down the street, and it looks like he is running away from the scene of a crime. Scene two, the camera angle changes, and the same skinhead is running towards a very well-dressed city gent carrying a brief briefcase, and we wonder, maybe the crime hasn't yet been committed, and we are going to see it. Scene three. Next, we see the skinhead grab the well-dressed man. Perhaps we are thinking we knew all along that he is going to steal the briefcase. This is a mugging that we are witnessing. Scene four. Finally, the camera angle pans out to reveal the wider scene when we see the skinhead actually run towards the man to grab hold of him, pushing him away from the falling masonry that was tumbling down, thereby saving this man, this well-dressed man, from certain injury and maybe even death. And the advert finishes, as the advert finishes, a voiceover says, it's only when you get the full picture that you can understand what is going on. It's only when we get the full picture we can understand what is going on. We sit on this side of history. We have the full picture of the day of resurrection before us. But for people like Mary and uh, Simon Peter and the other disciple, John, they were working on not having all of the information. 
John's gospel paints for us this scene. It was dark. Sunrise had not yet come, and it was eerily quiet. If you've ever been up at that time in the morning, you'll know just what it's like. Most of us aren't up at that time in the morning. I can tell by the look on your faces. Uh, even getting up for the Easter breakfast this morning was a struggle for some of us. But you know what it's like if you are ever up at that time in the morning. It's dark, it's eerily quiet. There's no one else about. It's a lonely time of day. There's no hustle. There's no bustle. This is when Mary arrives at the tomb. Perhaps following the custom of the day, the belief that the spirit of a deceased loved one hovered around the tomb for three days before departing. Maybe she was there because she was restless and couldn't sleep. The events of the past week that she had been through was still playing on her mind. And she needed to find some relief and rest, maybe. Perhaps it was her grief that brought her there. Grief can make us do strange and funny things, can't it? Even getting up at strange hours of the day and going to strange places. Maybe finding the place where the body of Jesus had been laid a consolation for her. She needed to be there near that place. Whatever it was that brought Mary to the tomb on that morning, what she found was what she wasn't expecting. Because as she arrives, she's shocked to discover that the tomb has been, in her mind, desecrated. And even worse than that, the body of Jesus has been stolen. It is gone. And in her distress, she immediately runs back to Simon, Peter, and John to tell them this terrible news. You see, we're still in scene one or scene two of the story here. There's no celebration. There's no joy. Only disbelief at these events. And these men needing to feel that they need to check out this woman's story. The gospel story tells us that they ran to the tomb. And the word there suggests an athlete competing in the ancient games, running with a purpose and an intense desire to get to a destination as quickly as possible. There's a sense of urgency about Peter and John's reaction. That even if they don't quite believe Mary's story, they have their own questions as to what may have happened. Who could have removed the body of Jesus and why? Could it have been stolen? Might there be clues there that they may go and find him? Remember at this point, no one realizes what we know, what we see has happened because they don't have the full picture. And who knows what must have been going through Simon, Peter, and John's minds as they arrived at the tomb, discovering that Mary was quite right. The stone had been moved, the body of Jesus gone. But even more mysterious than that, the body of Jesus was gone, but the grave clothes were still there. Whoever it is that has taken this body has gone to an awful lot of trouble to unwrap this corpse and lay out the strips of cloth and then take the body away. Which perhaps begs the question, what sort of grave robbers would do that? It's interesting when you dig a little deeper into what John's description is uh, in the reading there, uh, that we find that the grave clothes have not just been unwrapped, it's as if the body of Jesus had disappeared. It's as if they are still there, uh, the body is still there, but the grave clothes form the body. It's strange, it's unexpected. But again, they don't have the full picture, do they? We do. We know what is happening here. 
And when uh, John arrived at the scene, he says he saw and he believed. That's always been a curious uh, statement for me. He saw and he believed. But what did he believe? Did he believe Mary's story? Did he believe that the body was gone? Did he believe that the stone had been moved? What did he believe? In the end, Peter and John give up. <laughs> Typical men, isn't it, ladies? <laughs> they give up. They go back. Maybe it was too early for them. Maybe, I don't know. They went away. There's still no celebration, no joy for them. Just more confusion. It's not quite how we think of the Easter morning, is it? But now there's this other scene, this <clears throat> beautiful scene with Simon Peter and John having left the scene. Mary is there with her sorrow and her grief, weeping for her loss. Uh, as the reading was read to us, I, I kind of had in the, pic the picture in my mind of Mary, this solitary woman there, so distraught, so sad, weeping. If it wasn't bad enough for all of the events that had happened because of Jesus' death, now she has this added pain that the tomb has been vandalized and the body desecrated and missing. Grief for her is all-consuming, with the evidence right there before her eyes. She can smell the empty tomb. She can touch the folded grave clothes. She sees the angels in white sitting there where Jesus should have been. And we don't bat an eye, though, do we, when we read that? <laughs> angels. Wow. Angels sitting there where Jesus should have been. Two angels in recorded in such a matter-of-fact way as if it was relatively normal to meet angels. Maybe it was back then. Who knows? But it adds further mystery to the event, doesn't it? Mary herself seems unconcerned by their presence, simply answering their questions and repeating what she has told Simon Peter and John. They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Even she thinks that grave robbers have been at work. They have taken him away, and I don't know where they have put him. Mary will tell anyone what's happening. She will even tell a gardener who suddenly and mysteriously in this story appears, asking her, why are you so upset? We know who it is, don't we? We have the full picture, but she doesn't. Why doesn't she recognize Jesus? Is the light too dim to make him out? Is his body different in some way? What we know for certain is that she wasn't expecting to meet Jesus there in this way. And it's only when he says her name that it's almost as if the scales fall from, from her eyes and she sees who it is before her. He says, Mary, which she must have heard on countless number of occasions. Jesus calling out to her, Mary. And her mind, her body, her emotions, they all change gear. They click into a different gear. And suddenly she sees before her Jesus, alive. It's a moment of transformation. A moment that brings eternal hope and joy. For that is what today is all about. That is what we celebrate on this resurrection morning. Hope. 
the hope of God breaking through in a new and amazing way. That is the truth of this resurrection morning. And so what about you? What does this resurrection morning mean for you? John's account that we've read this morning of the resurrection is a personal story from the eyes of Mary, Mary Magdalene. She is the first witness that Jesus has risen from the dead. Um, amazing, if you think about it, in, this day, in that day and age, for a woman to be given that information first, that Jesus has risen from the dead. She becomes a herald for God, going and telling others, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. And our response must also be a personal decision about belief of the resurrection because you now have the full picture. You can see clearly what God has done in raising Jesus from the dead. And so what do you say? You may have had the opportunity at some point in life to fill in a survey uh, where there are three options for you to choose from. A yes box, a no box, or a don't know. And our response to the question of Jesus and the resurrection can be a yes, it can be a no, what it can't be is a don't know. Because we either believe it or we don't. It's as simple as that. We either say yes, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, alleluia, or we dismiss it. If we believe in the good news, that means we live in the power of the resurrection of God in our lives, in your life and in my life, following in the footsteps of Mary Magdalene and countless others who go and share the good news. That simple phrase, I have seen the Lord. I have met the Lord. I have met with Jesus in my life. On this resurrection morning, a day of celebration, a day of joy, my prayer is that God will reveal to you this wonderful good news that Jesus Christ is risen today and that it will change your life forever.